Okay. Um, obviously, the question of automation and technology has become one of the key issues of our age, um, which is often characterized as a digital age in the sense of, obviously, one which a society now dominated by smartphones, by social networks, artificial intelligence. And there's obviously a plethora of revolutionary potential out there in terms of this technology. Uh, the idea of driverless cars, virtual reality, 3D printing, you know, all of this makes possible the idea of a world of superabundance and of uh, a world of, of abundance of leisure time as well. But as the title of this, suge of this uh, session suggests, there's actually a lot of hope and fear at the same time in equal measure on this sort of question. On the one hand, you have these futurologists whose imaginations kind of run wild when they, when they see the, the potential technology that's out there. The possibility of for, full automation, as it's called, or uh, basically an end to work. But then alongside this, there's also a lot of apprehension and anxiety on this question. You see uh, phrases like technological unemployment, the idea that basically robots are going to take all of our jobs, uh, a race against the machine, as it's sometimes been called. Um, and in fact, this comes from the idea that obviously, yeah, we can see that jobs are being lost uh, to machinery, to technology, to robots and so forth. And increasingly, this technological change is happening at such a fast pace that people are being left behind and unable to kind of keep up with this ever-accelerating treadmill. In fact, there was one um, study done in Oxford, I think, uh, quite recently, where two academics, I think, they, they came up with an estimate that in America, by 2030, something like 50% of jobs currently existing could be automated away. And that's, a lot of that is not just the kind of traditional manufacturing jobs that have already been lost largely, uh, not lost to China and to uh, globalization, but actually lost to, to machinery and automation. Uh, not just those, but also now a kind of sweeping uh, job losses through you know, offices, through white collar jobs as artificial intelligence you know, and these sorts of technologies make it much easier to replace uh, people in accounting and uh, even law firms and things like this. These are the kind of jobs that are predicted to be under threat over the next decade. And I think it's within this kind of context that you see the emergence of the idea of a universal basic income. Um, but, uh, the, the idea of that, to, just in brief, is that it's an unconditional payment ba made to every citizen, regardless of their age, their wealth, or their employment status. That's, that's basically, in a, in a sentence, what universal basic income means. But what you see with UBI is that actually the opinions about it are equally as split as the kind of hopes and fears around technology and automation in general. On the one hand, you see uh, a section of the left in particular, um, progressives, who kind of think of uh, the idea of UBI as a step towards some sort of fully automated luxury communism, as the, the phrase has sometimes been used. Uh, in other words, a, a kind of a, a society where because of this technology, we can fulfill Marx's maxim that everyone can work according to their ability and take according to their needs. Some people see UBI as almost like a stepping stone onto that path. Uh, and also it's been argued on the left that UBI, in the very short term at least, would, would guarantee a kind of b bigger safety net, a, a better welfare state that workers could uh, fall back on. And that this in turn would kind of um, liberate them to go on strike more to, or to be able to pursue other uh, creative paths and so forth. It would give workers some sort of better bargaining uh, position in the workplace against the bosses. However, on the other side, you do also see a lot of people noting that this UBI uh, policy has been also proposed by some of the most ardent kind of libertarian right-wingers, people who see it as basically uh, an attempt to kind of get away with the bureaucracy of the welfare state as they see it, better to just scrap all the kind of public services and the, and the means-tested benefits and so forth, and instead just give a, a paltry amount to everyone behind, and use that basically as some sort of fig leaf behind which the kind of the general dynamics of capitalism, the general exploitation in the workplace can continue uh, at full speed. Um, and in fact, you have seen throughout history the idea of UBI being proposed by the right wing. In fact, Milton Friedman was, was in Feynman favor of uh, something similar, a, a negative income tax, he called it. But the, the, the idea was generally the same. So I think the fact that you see on both these questions, on automation and UBI, which are linked together through, as I've discussed, that I think it's um, the fact that you see the, the, the public opinion kind of split 
and, and the mood towards these things split, I think it reflects the fact that, in general, there is not a, a Marxist position, really, a Marxist approach taken in analysing these questions. I think what you often see is that the things like technology and UBI, when they're, when they're talked about in, uh, in any of the, kind of the mainstream press and so forth, mainstream commentators, it's always from a point of, of looking at it in isolation, looking at technological progress as some sort of um, kind of process that, that progress that takes place kind of independently of the rest of society, as though there's just, you know, obviously there is its own laws, it's like there's a, there's, there, is a, there, there is a kind of self-contained logic, if you like, within technological progress. But I think divorcing this and the question of UBI as well from the general political uh, context within which we see them, within the economic uh, context within which we see them, uh, you arrive at this kind of confused and uh, contradictory um, uh, position. I think we have to really focus, when we're looking at technological progress and em economic demands like UBI, economic reforms, we, we can't divorce them from these wider political questions. We have to raise those political questions, say, you know, at the end of the day, as with all reforms, who's going to pay for UBI? Uh, who owns and controls the technology in society in the first place? And most importantly, in whose interest are any of these things uh, being brought about? And I think to understand and, and answer that, we have to go back and, and take a Marxist approach and look at actually what Marx himself wrote on this kind of questions. Um, you know, Marx was very uh, prophetic in many respects. If you read his economic writings, a lot of the uh, kind of discussions that are taking place today were already answered in embryo by Marx in uh, things like Capital, where he discusses there's a whole chapter actually dedicated to the question of machinery and, and already looking at this question, you know, you already had movements like the Luddites where these, these mass movements of kind of rebellions of workers against the machines, against the, the automated looms and so forth, the mechanized looms, and, and they saw that as a threat to their jobs and they smashed the machinery up, that, uh, showing the kind of fear they had that these uh, machines were going to take their jobs. And it's very similar, obviously, to what we see today. And Marx commented on those movements at the time. And... Um, and what Marx said about machinery is, uh, is obviously we've got to see it within its economic context, which is capitalism, the system that we live in. Capitalism, a system where what we have is, is a generalized production and exchange of commodities, a system of production for profit. And these commodities, these products that are, are produced for exchange, they have uh, a value. They have a, a relative value compared to other commodities and that is dependent, Marx says, on the socially necessary labor time. In other words, the amount of labor time within a, a historical epoch, given the current levels of technology and education and so forth, there is a, a, a value associated, amount of a socially necessary labor time gone into creating these commodities, the average time taken based on the kind of current levels of technology and technique. And the key to understanding this is obviously the fact that labor itself is the source of all value. You know, things don't have value if they don't uh, require any labor time put into them. And Marx didn't just talk about the labor of the actual process itself, but also the labor contained within the raw materials and the technology that comes before uh, any, any given production process. In other words, you know, there's all, all, the, all the commodities that go into producing new commodities, the raw materials, the machines all of these transfer their value over into the new commodity. Marx called it dead labor, con congealed or crystallized dead labor from the past. And in this respect, machinery does not create any value itself, but rather transfers its value onto the new product. And so, you know, it's, it's human labor itself. It's, it's, it's mankind's uh, force on, on, on its world around us that creates value. And, uh, and the machines cannot produce any value. And that's very key because uh, as, as capitalism is a system of production for profit, and profit, Marx explains, is derived ultimately from the unpaid labor of the working class. And, uh, and if, if machines, therefore, cannot create profit for the capitalists, you know, it's only the, 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 um, uh, the application of labor and the, the production of surplus value, a value above and beyond what's paid back to the workers in the form of wages, that can create profits. And that's a key uh, idea that we'll, I'll come back to in a, in a minute. Um, now, it's, it's competition, obviously, in, in the drive to, to make more profits that chases the capitalists not only across the world to create a world market, but also forces them 
to reinvest their surplus, reinvest their profits into new machinery, into new technology, you know, into new science and uh, research and development and so forth. And the aim of that is obviously to try and reduce their costs overall, to replace labor with machines, to, to increase the kind of efficiency and productivity of production. And if they can do that as an individual capitalist, they can reduce the labor time of their products below that socially necessary average. In other words, they can sell at a lower price than what's offered on the market, outcompete their competitors and, uh, and push their fellow capitalists out of business. And so therefore, that's the, that's the drive, if you like, to, uh, to invest in, um, uh, in all of this uh, machinery and so forth. It's, uh, it's, it's ultimately to try and um, to increase the productivity, uh, to increase the amount of wealth, the amount of products that can be produced in a given amount of time. And, um, and, that, and as I say, that's, that's caused this, 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 in its heyday, what was actually a very progressive uh, process under capitalism. Marx actually, if you see the Communist Manifesto, he's full of, uh, you know, full of praise for capitalism in saying it's, it's achieved wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids and Roman aqueducts. You know, he had a great reverence for, uh, for capitalism as a progressive system in its heyday that was this drive, this competition, forcing the capitalists to invest and create the you know, incredible wonders in terms of technology and a, and a superabundance of wealth that obviously we see around us today. The problem is, under capitalism, because capitalism is fundamentally a system of private ownership over this technology, over the means of production by which wealth is produced, the problem arises that this whole process of technological development, of uh, investment in new machinery and new technology, all of this process occurs in a very unplanned, in a very anarchic way, in a very contradictory way as a result, um, where you have technology being introduced, not in the interests of society as a whole, not in order to free up workers in terms of their leisure time, reduce the hours of the working week and reduce the burden on the working class, but rather this technology is being introduced fundamentally, as I said, to improve uh, productivity from the point of view of the capitalists, to improve their profits and, uh, and make them super profits to capture new markets. That's really the basis behind all uh, drive for new technology in society. It's the, the, the fact that it might along the way provide some so, sort of social benefit is, is accidental as far as the capitalist is concerned. And, um, and this obviously leads to the reason why you get these kind of hopes and fears about technology. It expresses the contradictory process of technological development of, of how it's introduced through this invisible hand, through the market, rather than in a planned and rational way. And in fact, the, the capitalists themselves even have a term for this. Schumpeter, an Austrian economist, a uh, kind of forefather of kind of neoliberal economics, you know, a peer of uh, kind of Hayek and these types, he came up with the term creative destruction to, to describe how capitalism uh, progresses in this way. In other words, he saw... Uh, what, what capitalism would do is, yes, it would create new jobs, yes, it would create new industries, but it would first have to destroy the old ones to free up labor, to free up capital and so forth. And therefore, he thought the market was the best way of doing this. It would allocate resources in the most efficient way. And obviously, just a, a look back at history shows how utopian this idea was and how divorced from reality it was. You know, look at, look at what's happened in terms of obsolete industries like mining in Britain. You know, this was not closed down in a kind of, you know, in a calm, gradual way in which the workers were retrained and then moved into new jobs, but rather you had the full force of the state destroying the miners' industry, closing down the mines, and, and trying to break the whole back of the labor movement. And it's, it's, and it's left, obviously, a scar of unemployment in these regions. And the same is true uh, in a lot of places today. You see, um, you know, this in, in Wales right now, for example, the steel industries at Port Talbot closed down as a result of the glut of uh, steel that's produced on a world scale. You know, this huge overproduction of steel, actually, that's found its way onto the world market. And the, the jobs there cannot be uh, kept in order to provide for, uh, for other things, other socially necessary things, but rather are just closed down and, uh, and those industries are, are left, and the, the, those whole communities, in fact, are left behind. Um, so you see, yes, there is new jobs and technology created, but it's always for the benefit of the 1%, if you like, or even the 0.01%. They're the ones who benefit from these productivity gains and from this wealth that's created. And simultaneously, obviously, millions are left behind, are left on the scrap heap, and are forced actually into very precarious jobs, into very low pay and very low productive jobs. In fact, I think the fact that you see today 
um, these two things conditioning one another. You know, on the one hand, we've got these incredibly productive industries in, the, in terms of like the tech monopolies that kind of dominate a lot of the global economy today. The, glo- the, the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks of this world that are worth billions and, uh, and have bill- are sitting on cash piles of billions. On the one hand, they are incredibly productive in terms of the value they're producing with a relatively small workforce, but it's a very educated workforce. You know, it's a very elite workforce that's kind of plucked from the best universities and so forth. And, uh, and they are earning a bomb, you know, not only the executives, but some of these very uh, high-end workers there. But at the same time, the jobs that they've displaced, the people that, uh, who are displaced by the, the kind of technologies they're creating are going into this gig economy that is, in fact, run by the same technology firms, you know, the, the Ubers and the Deliveroo's of this world, which are actually very low productive jobs when you look at it. Like, why are we paying people to cycle around uh, London, often like risking their lives given how fast they're, they're going and ignoring all the traffic? You know, that, 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 that is very low productive work, you know, literally backbreaking work and on a very low pay as well. So it shows you how the two things have conditioned each other. The, the productivity gains in the hands of the 1% have meant to this general lowering of living standards and uh, de- degradation of work for the rest. It's, it's in fact, um, the two, as the two, as I say, condition each other because the, 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 what Marx called the reserve army of labor that is created by, un, uh, by this kind of technological unemployment, the fact that there are machines that can uh, work instead of uh, workers to do these jobs, it obviously puts a downward pressure on wages in general, alongside the political attacks on the unions, the globalization and the kind of competition of workers worldwide. All of this has put a downward pressure on wages to the extent that actually it's now, in fact, cheaper in many cases to use an army of low-paid workers than it is to invest in a, in a machine in the first place. Why re-kit your whole factory with a new productive process if you can just get in a load of people on zero-hour contracts in an Amazon warehouse or something like that to just literally be picking up the, uh, the boxes and taking them from A to B? That's, uh, that's, that shows you how, how these two processes condition each other. And actually, it's a process that Marx himself commented on in Capital. I think, uh, I think it's in Chapter 15, the one on machinery. If you want to learn more, you can buy an excellent book over there called Understanding Capital uh, by yours truly and Rob Sewell. Um, and uh, it's got, obviously, uh, highlights all the sections in that chapter where Marx talks about this process, where he actually predicts and says, you know, you can get this situation where capitalism itself becomes the barrier to the deployment of technology, where it becomes more um, efficient, if you like. It becomes more... Uh, uh, more cost-effective, rather, from the point of view of the capitalist. It's rational from their point of view to not invest in machinery, to not invest in technology, and to just use this army of cheap labor that they've helped to create in the first place. And this is all taking place, obviously, at the same time in the context of a general crisis of overproduction, where you've got this, uh, this, this vast glut of commodities produced on a world scale that cannot be absorbed by the market. It cannot be absorbed by the workers themselves on, on the, the, the measly wages. And, uh, and in fact, automation and the replacement of wage labor with machines exacerbates this process even further. There's actually quite a good, um, I think, unfortunately, an apocryphal story, but nevertheless quite an interesting story anyway that demonstrates this point where apparently uh, Henry Ford, he of kind of fame for creating kind of automation on a mass scale, apparently... He was being taken round one of his newly automated factories by a trade union rep. And uh, he point, Henry Ford pointed at the machines and the, the robots and he said to the trade union rep kind of very proudly, ha, you know, like I've, I'm going to break the back of your union because how are you going to get these machines to play, pay your union dues, to pay your, your, your union membership fees? And the union rep just turns around quick as a flash and says, yeah, but how are you going to get the robots to buy your cars? And that's the point, right, under capitalism. You know, the, the, the machines that are producing this glut of commodities at the end of the day, obviously with human labor involved in it, but very minimal, you know, increasingly minimal amount of human labor. But then how, how the machines don't need any goods to, they're not buying anything, they don't get an income. And it's the working class which is seeing their conditions eroded over time, attacked over time, finding itself increasingly difficult to actually buy back all these goods. And in fact, under capitalism, the working class can never buy back all these goods because of the nature of capitalism and how profit is created in the first place as the unpaid labor of the working class. 
and expresses, if you like, the, the real crisis-ridden, the inherently crisis-ridden nature of capitalism. But understanding that process, I think, also helps explain um, some of the, these kind of seemingly paradoxical questions that have arisen today. There's a, there's a very popular kind of, um, kind of zeitgeist theme within a lot of the, the kind of uh, financial and uh, economic kind of papers and journals now, and, and it's increasingly kind of being raised elsewhere, which is this idea of the productivity puzzle. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people in the press these days talking about you know, very clearly, actually, you can see it in the statistics. This is worrying the capitalists themselves, worrying the kind of the ruling class, which is there is a general uh, stagnation actually taking place in productivity. Whereas in the past period, in you know the 19th century, the earlier 20th, you had big innovations, big technologies making huge leaps forward in terms of uh, technology. You know, the electricity, the railways, things like this that massively boosted productivity figures. In the last few decades not just since the crisis of 2008, but even before that, in Britain and America and other advanced capitalist countries, you've seen a stagnation of productivity. In other words, reflecting the fact that um, you've got exactly this process I'm talking about going on. Where it, and it seems very paradoxical, because on the one hand, there's this fear that there's too much automation taking place, that we're all about to lose our jobs to robots, or already losing our jobs to robots. And on the other hand, we're being told, well, actually, there's not enough technology because productivity is stagnated. And that contradiction seems, precisely as it is, it seems like a paradox. And, and, it, and that's why they call it the productivity puzzle. And all the bourgeois economists scratch their heads and come up with all sorts of mysterious explanations for why this might be the case. Maybe it's a, a statistical error, they say, or just some sort of measurement error. But it actually comes back to this contradictory way in which technology is being introduced, where there are massive productivity gains and huge amounts of people are being you know, made obsolete, if you like, from the point of view of capitalism. But the point is they're not unemployed, they're not uh, just left completely in the scrap. They're forced into these very low productivity jobs, like the gig economy, as I said, and that lowers the average productivity across the, uh, the, whole, um, the whole of uh, society, across the whole economy. And that's really the, 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 the long and the short of this puzzle that has the, uh, the kind of bourgeois economists um, you know, so confused. But it's very simple if you understand it from, uh, from a point of view of, of, of capitalism and how capitalism works. In other words, it's what Marx describes very clearly as accumulation of wealth at one pole and accumulation of misery and toil at the other. That's fundamentally what this process uh, amounts to. And it reflects, as I say, the contradictory nature of technological progress under capitalism, which Engels also talked about in um, his pamphlet Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, which I think is also available at the back to buy. Um, and it's an excellent pamphlet, where in the third chapter he talks about, again, the development of capitalism historically. And he points out something very interesting. He says, look, there's actually, within capitalism, despite what the free marketeers always tell you about the free market being the most efficient system, he po Engels points out within any capitalist firm, there's an enormous level of planning that actually goes on. Just in the last session, we were talking about this in terms of, you know, in, in any supermarket, the, the, the planning that goes on from the shops and the supermarkets down to the farms and the factories in terms of, you know, knowing this kind of supply chain that's incredibly complex, knowing how much to, vo to order in and so forth of any product, and all of that done by customers themselves, obviously, You've got self-checkout machines, another good example of automation replacing the, uh, the, the, the tillers who used to be there. And, uh, and all of that going on. It's an incredible level of planning, actually, when you think about it. But obviously, within the firm, it takes place not to, to lower the hours of the workers, uh, that workers have to work or anything, but to, to increase the profits of the capitalism. And between different firms, Engels points out, anarchy reigns. You have the anarchy of the market where there's no planning at all. And it's that... Uh, kind of uh, that dualism, if you like, that, that contradiction that means that these new technologies and, and techniques um, uh, are not distributed, the, the, the gains of them, the productivity gains are not distributed across the whole economy. And it's within all of this that we see, as I say, this, this so-called solution being proposed, uh, particularly on the left of UBI, of the universal basic income, um, which is meant to somehow kind of recompense obsolete workers and, and the 99% in society by providing them with some sort of basic unconditional income. And it actually stems from an idea proposed long ago by uh, Thomas Paine, who, uh, who, said, who proposed it as, a, as a basically a tax on the landlords. He said, look, they're, they're generating all this rent from the land, 
and uh, they, should, they should give some of it back and there should be a tax on the landlords, tax on their rents and an income given to all citizens. And actually, interestingly, Thomas Paine raised it not as a, as a revolutionary demand particularly, but actually as a way of trying to co-opt the whole of society into the, the current status quo. He said, you know, I'm not trying to get rid of the landlords and their, and their kind of parasitic nature. Rather, I'm gonna, in order to justify having them there in the first place and stop people rebelling against them, we're going to tax some of their rents and kind of co-opt people in. Say, look, you can be a part of our society, be a part of, you know, be a citizen in this, uh, in this land, but... Uh, you know, fundamentally the status quo will stay the same. The exploiters and the exploited will still exist. And I think that's very key to understanding the question of UBI today because UBI is not an automatically progressive policy, you know. And in fact, there's no such thing as an automatically progressive policy or an automatically progressive technology in society. We have to look at these things in terms of who's raising them and in whose interests. I think if it was raised as part of a radical left-wing program, as part of a general program to improve the lives of ordinary people, to improve the conditions of the working class, obviously UBI would be something that you would support. If it was funded by making the rich pay for it, uh, by by providing a stronger safety net and uh, a welfare state, obviously, like any reform, we as Marxists would, would support that. Marxists... Uh, do not you know, reject reforms because they somehow maintain capitalism. There's, there's unfortunately some ultra-left types uh, who call themselves very revolutionary who think that you, know, you shouldn't even support reforms because it, it wet, you know, dampens the appetite for revolution or it somehow accelerates conditions to being so bad that you'll have people uh, trying to overthrow capitalism even quicker. No, we don't believe that. As genuine Marxists fight for any reform but obviously point out that they can only be uh, guaranteed on the basis of a mass movement that actually goes to, to abolish capitalism and, and, over, and overthrow capitalism and transform society along socialist lines. Um, so as part of a general left program, obviously we would support this as a stepping stone towards that, as a transitional demand, if you like, in that, in that, in that process to give confidence to workers to fight to change society. But we've also got to see, as I say, that there's people on the libertarian right wing who are raising this, as I say, to provide some sort of facade behind which the exploitation, the status quo of of oppression and uh, and exploitation can continue, and in fact continue at an ever greater pace. Because obviously it gives a veneer of improvement for the workers. Meanwhile, the bosses can continue to cut wages, to you continue to have austerity on public services and so forth. And it doesn't do anything, as I say, to really challenge fundamentally that question of, of who owns and controls the power and, and the, the economy in society. Now, as I, say, some, as I said earlier, some people with, who've advocated UBI from the left, they put forward it as a, as a solution because they say, well, you know, it will help people in the gig economy. It will uh, it'll strengthen their position. If they're not having to worry about being made unemployed and losing their job and being made you know, completely uh, impoverished overnight, if they know there's that safety net to fall back on, that means they can fight to improve their uh, conditions. It means they can not have to take on the most exploitative jobs and it will improve, therefore, the general push for better wages across the working class. And um, we've got to say, yes, obviously it would do that if it was introduced. But you've got to ask yourself, you know, this kind of chicken and egg problem here. Who would introduce such a UBI in the first place? Who would, who, what, how would you get to have this, uh, this nice position, this strengthened position for the working class in the first place? Obviously, the only way you could introduce such a policy is, is, a, is, a, is if the state itself introduces it. And, uh, and what kind of state would do that? It would have to be uh, a radical left government put, putting it in place under pressure from below, on the back of a mass movement. And the point is that such a government would already necessarily be uh, in trying to improve workers' conditions across the board. It would be trying to strengthen the trade union laws, strengthen uh, workers' rights and so forth, and, uh, and standing up for workers against the big tech monopolies, against the, uh, the big businesses and so forth. Um, in other words, that kind of economic gain of UBI cannot be divorced from the general question of class struggle, of political struggle and political power. Um, and the other, the other key point is obviously who pays. You know, that has to be our question with any demand, any reform, if we're going to ask whether it's really uh, being introduced in a progressive way or not, is who pays for it. A UBI actually 
uh, would be enormously expensive. And this is obviously raised as one of the criticisms from the right wing. I think uh, in Switzerland, they actually had a referendum on the question of UBI, uh, which failed because the, there was this hysteria raised about how much taxes would have to increase. And there's other studies that show that in America, for example, a 10% uh, sorry, a $10,000 uh, a year basic income, which is hardly an enormous amount, actually, would, would result in a 10% increase, a 10 percentage point increase in terms of the taxes raised. And you'd have to say, well, who's going to pay those taxes? Because it's very clear already under capitalism that the big tech companies, the big monopolies, the banks, they're not willing to pay these taxes already. As we've discussed throughout this weekend, they're threats to withdraw their money. And in fact, the people who are most guilty of this tax dodging are actually often the tech companies themselves like Google and Facebook, which uh, are kind of facing court cases over these things. And the people who are trying to circumvent the existing kind of workers' rights are people like Uber. You know, look at the, the battle that's going on in London right now about the banning of Uber. It shows these companies do not respect workers' rights. They do not respect paying their taxes, and they will do anything they can to try and dodge it. And it's true, obviously, of the capitalist class in general. So, You've got, uh, within that context, this crisis of capitalism and the, and, and the, the big monopolies already uh, doing everything they can to avoid paying for that crisis. You're having the uh, people on the left saying, well, look, let's have an even bigger shake-up of the welfare state. It's almost kind of a double or nothing sort of approach. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's kind of quite utopian in a socialist sense, utopian socialist sort of sense. They've come up with a nice blueprint and imagine it can just fall from the sky because it kind of, you know, this manna from heaven will just come in because it, it makes so much sense and it, it'll benefit everyone. And, uh, and it comes down to this idea really that somehow the austerity we're seeing, the attacks we're seeing are just ideological, that they're, 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 they're just the result of nasty capitalists and that somehow you could persuade the capitalists to be less nasty, to, to get rid of austerity, to get rid of the attacks, to, 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 to put these sort of things in place because they themselves might benefit a bit from it. In other words, there's a reliance here uh, with these kind of demands on, um, uh, on basically kind of a philanthrop philanthropic sort of capitalist, you know, reliance on a benevolence of the capitalist class and, uh, and on and the benevolence of the capitalist state to kind of carry these things out. And it really raises, again, all the questions we've discussed this weekend already about the nature of the state under capitalism and the fact that obviously it, it exists not as a, a neutral entity that exists to kind of protect the majority of people in society, but rather, in the words of Lenin, it is ultimately armed bodies of men in defense of private property, in defense of the, the interests of the ruling class. And, um, and, and therefore, you know, you're not going to get uh, the capitalist state, uh, you know, a Tory government or any kind of philanthropic uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs introducing these kind of ideas as much as you might have the odd person here and there advocating it. In fact, one person who has been quite prominent in this debate is Bill Gates, obviously one of the richest men in the world, who's all in favor of giving some of his money away when it's on his terms. But I imagine if anyone said, right, let's nationalize Microsoft then, he'd probably have a problem with that. Uh, so it shows you how limited the philanthropy really is. But what he has suggested, interestingly, is the idea that you should tax the robots to pay for this. Oh, that's very nice, isn't it? Don't tax the rich. No, they can keep their money. Tax the robots. Now, that's, that sounds great, but who are we taxing here? Is there, is there, are we going to tax Wally? Are we going to tax Terminator? Like, I mean, it's a farcical idea, really. Like, these robots aren't walking around people who have an income that you can tax. There's machinery, there's technology, there's software in society, including software made by Microsoft that is making people redundant because, you know, why have, why have a secretary anymore when you can have uh, a word processor or a you know, uh, Google Translate and these kind of things. You know, there's obviously uh, all of that technology out there that is creating these productivity gains and making workers obsolete. But how do you tax that? You're going to tax the software? You're going to tax the individual, uh, you know, uh, computers and so forth? It's a farcical idea. And really, the only thing it could possibly mean, if it means any, many, makes any sense at all, is if you were to tax the profits derived from the machines and the people who employ them. Uh, in other words, to tax the profits of the rich. But obviously that, from a capitalist point of view, would lead to the opposite of what's intended. Because if you tax the rich, you tax them for investing and, and making the process more productive, then instead they're going to rely not on investing in machinery, but in, on employing that army of labor, that low-paid labor, that low-productivity labor that I talked about earlier. So rather than actually improving uh, the, the situation for the majority of people, 
you'd end up with a situation where we had even more reliance on low pay and low uh, productivity. In other words, what it shows you really is these kind of reformist solutions to try and introduce these sort of reformist measures always end up actually producing the opposite of what's intended. You try and regulate capitalism. You don't get a kinder form of capitalism. What you get is the worst of both worlds. You neither get the, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, the creative destruction, if you like, of the free market, uh, which the, the, the libertarians advocate, nor would you have a proper planned economy in the way that we would advocate. You get the worst of both worlds. And it shows you always the limits of trying to solve these sort of problems um, and highlights the, 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 the kind of dead end of reformism in these, in these um, processes. The point we've got to make is, you know, we're not against productivity and automation efficiency. The problem obviously arises that the gains of, of automation are only accrue in, the, in private hands and the losses of, autom- of, of any lack of automation, also that burden falls on the shoulders of the working class in the form of things like the gig economy. And you see this similarly with things like the Uber ban actually, like the reformist approach in this situation where you've got Uber kind of misbehaving, trying to bully uh, local uh, governments and so forth into accepting and bully workers into accepting poor conditions. You know, the, 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 the solution in London has just been to ban this company outright. But what have you ended up with? 40,000 jobs potentially at risk. And, uh, and what a, a service that's become quite vital to a lot of people is actually also uh, potentially under threat. The, the real solution is not just to ban these co- sort of companies, but to say, look, they should be brought in-house. They should be brought into public ownership. You know, we already have uh, a transport network that actually is, va- although in, nominally in public hands, the, pu- the buses are still privately owned. Uh, there's private contracts on a lot of the tubes and so forth. But nevertheless, there's the potential to bring all of that into public ownership, into public hands. Why not have an integrated app that allows you to travel around London uh, on the tubes, the bikes, the buses, and the ride hailing in the the cabs and so forth, whilst also giving workers the right to unionize, to to form a unionized workforce that can fight for better conditions. That would be the real approach to these sort of solutions. But it's not raised by the reformists because it raises precisely the kind of questions they're afraid of tackling, the question of ownership and so forth. And that's really the central problem to UBI. It doesn't concentrate on this class question, on the question of who owns and controls the technology in society. And actually, interestingly, Marx had this same kind of polemical debate with the reformists of his time, actually. He had it with a group called the Lasallians, who had produced this uh, Gotha program that he felt necessary to critique. And you can buy the critique of the Gotha program somewhere at the back as well, I'm sure. But in it, it's very, it's very interesting. He, he criticizes the kind of reformist socialists by, for saying... Look, you're putting all the emphasis on the question of distribution, constantly talking about distributing the wealth that's already there. But why not talk about production? Why, instead of talking about the inequality that exists within distribution of wealth, why not talk about the inequality in terms of the means of production by which wealth is produced in the first place? And he says, if you tackle that question, the inequality of distribution disappears. If you have a more equitable distribution of the means of production, if you have common ownership over the means of production, the means by which new wealth is produced, rather than just trying to tax and spend and distribute the wealth that's already out there, he says then inequality will automatically uh, kind of uh, wither away. And, um, and therefore, the solution really is not uh, these kind of new fangled, new elaborate tax and spend systems like UBI, which fundamentally leave the whole capitalist dynamic, the whole capitalist uh, system, uh, which is an, an inherently unequal system, uh, in terms of you know the fact that the, the, the profits are derived from the unpaid labour of the working class. You know, capitalism necessarily the wealth of the few depends on the impoverishment and the exploitation of the many. Capitalism is an inherently unequal system. But instead of challenging that, things like UBI, these kind of tax and spend, it always hits the wrong people. Actually, even the taxes themselves hit the wrong people because the rich will evade the taxes. They will move their money offshore. And actually, it'll be, end up being the middle classes uh, who could be won over to the idea of a planned economy who end up um, being uh, hit by these kind of systems. And so, therefore, you know, we should say, look, we're in favor of the rich paying. But rather than the only way we're going to get them to pay properly is actually if we take, we expropriate, you know, if we actually take these technologies, these, these mega monopolies and so forth, these multinationals into public ownership and democratic control. Now... And in that respect, uh, we've got to be very clear that actually the problem with capitalism 
is not so much its, inequ- in a, its inequality. The actual inequality flows, it's a symptom really of the, of the whole system, as I said. And Trotsky pointed this out himself. I just want to read a little quote from the revolution portrayed. He says, The fundamental evil of the capitalist system is not the extravagance of the possessing classes, however disgusting that may be in itself, but the fact that in order to guarantee its right to extravagance, the bourgeoisie maintains its private ownership of the means of production, thus condemning the economic system to anarchy and decay. I think that very, very well sums up the problem. The problem is not the inequality. That is a symptom of the real problem. The real thing holding society back, our real criticism of capitalism, if you like, is not simply the horrific, which, and it is horrific, the barbaric inequality that exists in society where eight billionaires or whatever it is own as much as the bottom 50%. Rather, it's the fact that the fact that they, in order to get that wealth, they have private ownership over the technology. They, 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 they become a barrier to the development of technology, of science, of industry, of uh, society itself. And UBI does nothing to, 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 to fundamentally solve these problems. In fact, you, you know, it, what, what UBI really shows is it highlights the kind of paradox that exists. It highlights the absurdity that exists, where on the one hand, you have this technological unemployment, this millions of people made obsolete, uh, alongside this kind of millions of other people who are, who are forced into overwork, into precarious jobs. You know, that, the fact that that kind of contradiction exists uh, and that UBR highlights it really shows you the real problem that's uh, at play here. And, uh, and therefore, as I said, at best, UBI should really be considered a transitional demand, if you like, something that highlights the absurdity of these contradictions and is linked to the question of the class struggle, of the need for the working class to take power and the, take the, levers, the key levers of the economy into their hands, demonstrating, and it really demonstrates, as I say, the potential for a genuine socialist society, a society based on superabundance, based on a plethora of leisure time, And that, in turn, obviously, that plethora of leisure time being the basis for genuine democracy, for the genuine involvement of the masses in uh, in the running and planning of society. And uh, and interestingly, um, in the last week, actually, I think it was last weekend, Corbyn actually made a speech. uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, made a speech on the on this question of this this kind of modern question about technology, about um, you know robots and uh, things like Uber and this these sort of things. And he actually said Labour's programme is going to be, uh, should be, to put the, the robots under workers' control and ownership. I think that sounds quite nice. It sounds a lot better than Bill Gates' tax the robots. But we've got to be uh, very clear. I think what Corbyn's really, he's putting it quite vaguely, and actually what he, I think he means a lot of the time is the idea of cooperatives. You know, he's even said Uber should be run as a cooperative by the workers. We'd say, no, let's go further. Uber should exist as a... As, 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 and these sort of services should exist as publicly owned, democratically controlled services, companies and industries and so forth. And, uh, and if we did that, and if we put these robots and machinery and technology as part of a plan of production, then we could really put into place Marx's Max's, maxim, of, you know, this motto of from each according to their ability, each according to their needs. You know, we are not Luddites. You know, we should make that very clear. We are not against technological progress. We are not against scientific development. We are in favor of automation, of innovation, and all of these sorts of things. But you cannot divorce these from the question of ownership in terms of who runs and controls society. I think a democratic plan of production could share the gains across the whole of society, could share these benefits of technology across society, share the workout, reduce the hours of the working week down to a minimum, Actually, Trotsky himself described the idea that, you know, you could, you could imagine very clearly a world where all it was taken was to pull a lever or press a button. The whole economy whirs into action and we sit there kind of reaping the rewards of that. But it has to be on the basis of a democratic, rational plan of production, on the basis of a socialist plan of production that allows all of us to fulfill our full potential, that allows us to live in harmony with the planet around us, between, obviously, between ourselves and the planet, between you know, harmony between man and machine and obviously between each other. And I think this has to be the kind of revolutionary change that we're fighting for, that we do fight for. And this is the the program of the IMT. And I hope you join us in that fight. We'll leave it there. (laughs)